Christoph, what is it about consciousness that provokes such radically different ideas about what it really is? From the somewhat mundane, it's an accidental byproduct of evolution that may or may not have occurred, to some people who say it's a fundamental part of the structure of the universe. What is it? Well, I mean, what's different about consciousness than anything else, it has its uh, subjective uh, aspect that nothing else in the universe seems to have. So we, we scientists are very good at studying these objective properties, like a, we can study a black hole, we can study a virus, we can study a brain. They all have what philosophers refer to as third, um, um, third um, point of view properties. They have mass, they have energy, you can poke them, you can analyze the wiring scheme and, and the wiring scheme. But what the brain has in a live brain, an awake brain, like your brain and my brain, it also has these subjective feelings. Pain, pleasure, seeing red, smelling mom's apple pie. And it's not at all clear. There seems to be an explanatory gap between the physics of the brain on the one hand and these conscious sensations. My brain is subject to the same laws of physics as my liver is or my heart is or my leg, but none of those things seem to generate consciousness, seem to generate feelings. My, my heart, unlike what the Greeks thought, doesn't generate any feelings. It's my yeah. brain does. So where's the difference between, I mean, both are physical objects, both are subject to the same physics law, but one gener exudes consciousness and the other one doesn't. And that seems to be mysterious and magical, just like you take a brass lamp and you rub it and suddenly a <laughs> genie appears. Well, the argument is that, uh, you know, how long have we been studying the brain? A few hundred years, seriously, and only in the last century with, with modern techniques. So we're so early. Early in the in the process, uh, how how could you say that uh, we won't uh, eventually figure out how some circuitry lends itself to the, these properties? Well, so some philosophers take this defeatist point of view, and they <laughs> argue that we shall never know because. <laughs> In, um, so until recently, uh, the only recourse we had when we studied consciousness was sort of armchair philosophizing, mm -hmm. what we're doing right now. Yeah, we're sitting well. in an armchair and we're <laughs> we speculating. But since 100 years, roughly, we can do experiments. We can poke the brain. We can study mm -hmm. it in disease. We can study it in the clinic. And so now we can begin to make progress. But philosophers, or at least some philosophers, argue that at least in, pr in principle, conceptually, they don't see any way how the world of physics can f can be linked with the world of conscious sensation. It to be world apart, there is this chasm, this explanatory gap between them, and they, they don't see how those can be bridged. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. People have made similar <laughs> observations 100 years ago when it came to life. They said, yeah, you know, yeah, life is right. inexplicable, and we need new forces, we need new physics, we need elan vital, or that all sorts of other terms for it. And it turned out, no, you can, conventional science can actually explain how you go from the inorganic to the organic world. And I think something similar will, will happen. Ultimately, science will be able to explain um, consciousness. It might, new f it might need new fundamental insights. It might take a, a reformulation of, uh, of certain aspects of science. But I think science is up to the challenge. So that's a reductionist position, where reductionist means that you'll be able to explain this subjective feeling of consciousness in terms of the basic physics laws that we know. I don't think of it that way, because we might have to enhance those laws of physics. We might have to introduce uh, additional quantities that were not there before. As an analogy, people studied, um, you know, uh, magnets in the 16th and 17th century until they mm. realized, well, there seems to be this mm. new force there. If you take a needle and you, you have this magnetite, right. it seems to, there seems to be something special mm. going on. And so people had to introduce this new thing called magnetic fields. And then finally Maxwell came along and showed that magnetic fields relate to electric field. And now we, we, call, we call them electromagnetic mm. fields. So it might be similar in consciousness research that we might have to introduce something new to the universe, there's space and time and energy. And there might be something new that, that we need to introduce in order to have a fully formulated a view that includes consciousness. So would that mean that consciousness is an ultimate fact that would be irreducible without that new formulation that you need? I, I do believe that's the case, but that's not universally held. Other people who study consciousness think, think of it as an emergent phenomenon. You take one neuron, you don't get consciousness. You take two or three mm. or four, you don't get consciousness. You take 100 billion, roughly, that's the number we have in our brain, and then you get consciousness. An analogy might be an atomic bomb. You take a, a certain number of, of, uh, of uh, <coughs> atoms of uh, uranium-235, and it's radioactive, but it just sits there. You add a few more, and you have an atomic bomb. Yes. Yeah, a yeah. wetness of water. Two molecules <coughs> of water aren't wet, but you take enough of them, they, be, they become wet. And this is really the standard view of most neuroscientists, frankly. Correct, that consciousness is an emergent phenomenon. And if I recall correctly, sitting in this room together with you four or five years ago, that was your view, that you were a, a, a person who would say that consciousness is, is an emergent property, we don't understand it yet, but we will, and we don't need anything more. 
Well, so today I would say I would take this more refined point of view uh, <laughs> uh, that it's both. In, 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 in other words, that we do need to introduce something in, into the universe. Let's call it experience or integrated information that's, that's fundamental to the universe. But it's also true that if you have a small brain like a bee, so bee is a wonderful mm -hmm. creature. You know, bee, she only has 800,000 neurons. But there might be, it might be, I think it's quite possible that it might feel like something to be a bee. Uh -huh. that, bee that a bee has a little feeling that it encounters this magic nectar, it smells something and it has a feeling of happiness. That's not to say that I, with a vastly bigger brain, don't have much larger repertoire of conscious states. So but there is something different between a tiny brain and a, and a huge brain. But both brains would experience something. But to experience that something, would you need something beyond the traditional four forces of physics? Well, it's not a force of physics. You need some additional assumption, yes. So you need an assumption, so the assumption I think is plausible, that 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 ultimately the, the right idiom to talk about consciousness, I think, is, is uh, information theory. And, and um, because ultimately it's not the stuff that brains are made out of that is important for consciousness. It's a relationship of the, of the stuff inside my head. It's not the fact that it's a bilipid membrane and squishy, you know, and squishy nerves. I think in principle this could also be silicon and titanium in a, in a computer, in a computer, let's say, in 100 years from now. But ultimately what matters is the fact that it's an enormously complex network and it's heavily interlaced and heavily interconnected. And this complexity, this complexity is sufficient by itself. I mean, you have to define complexity in a very precise mathematical way, not in this loose way that I use it now. And I think that is what fundamentally generates consciousness. So, so this theory asserts then that, that anything that's sufficiently complex that has this particular type of complexity has some conscious sensation. That sounds very radical. Well, you can go back, uh, you can think of it as there are ancient precursors for this. Uh, for example, this one of this theory would imply some sort of panpsychism in a sense that consciousness can be found everywhere where you have complexity. You have a little complexity in a tiny worm and then there could be a t tiny, you know, atom of consciousness there and you have these vastly hypertrophied um, networks in our brain, there's vast amount of consciousness and maybe in some future point when all the comp when all the the planet gets interlaced in some hyper you know hyper uh, internet then that might also have its consciousness of its own uh, that that is certainly arguable but the fundamental question is is do each of those from the bee to the human to the to the world wide web whatever you want that's complex is that just an emergent property of 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 complex networks or do you need to introduce some fundamental new principle or force in the universe well, I think you do, because you have to explain most of the things that go inside my head are not conscious. Right? So 150 years of psychology and our own life experiences and, you know, reading Sigmund Freud and all of that has taught us that most of the things that go on in my head, I have no idea. I open my eyes, I see you. I have no idea how I do it. <laughs> you ask me a question, I, I understand it. I have no idea. I don't have access to the individual bits. I, you know, I say something, I hear some words coming out of my mouth. I hope they make sense. But it's not that I'm sitting there and sort of saying, okay, this is now what I'm going to say. And here's the verb. And here I'm going to use this noun. And actually, I'm German, so I have to now translate it from German. <laughs> English. No, nothing of that happens. I think about and then words come pouring out of my mouth. All of that is unconscious. I, you can have strong feelings of love, of hate, of ennui, of lust. You don't know where those feelings come from. You've got to talk to your friends, to your loved ones, to the psychoanalyst to try to understand <laughs> why you have these strong feelings. So the fact of the matter is most things in your brain, most things in your body, you have no idea they're happening. They're happening to you. But there's a special subset of states in your body, in your, in particularly in your brain, particularly in some parts of your brain that seem to give rise to these sensations. And so where is the difference between that. It can't just be numbers of neurons. It can't just be, why? Well, because we know, folks, ironically, we know the following fact. There's this little brain, the cerebellum, at the back here. Actually, it's ironic because it's, it's little brain, but it actually contains 80% of all your brain cells. Four to five cells in your brain are a member of the cerebellum. If you lose the cerebellum due to a stroke or tumor, you won't be a dancer, you, you know, your motion, your, your, your speech will be slurred, like you sound like you're a little bit drunk, you know, your, your emotions will be incoherent, your gait won't be steady, but you won't have any trouble with consciousness. You can hear and smell, you can remember. So we know that those neurons are not part of consciousness. There are many other parts of the brain that we know that are not involved. Other parts are involved, particularly the cerebral cortex and the thalamus. So we know there has to be something about that. So it's not just numbers of neurons that's relevant.